So let's now look at some specific synovial joints beginning with the shoulder joint, also referred to as the glenohumeral joint. And this is the joint between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity, sometimes referred to as the glenoid fossa of the scapula. It is a ball and socket joint, and in fact, it is often used in the discussion of your typical ball and socket. Your shoulder joint, or glenohumeral joint, allows more motion than any other joint that we have in the body. In other words, the shoulder joint has the greatest range of motion. However, because of its greatest range of motion out of all the joints that we have in the body, it happens to be the least stable. So in the beginning of this chapter, we talked about the compromise between mobility, the range of motion, and the stability of the joint. It's an inverse relationship, which means that if we have greater range of motion or greater mobility, then the stability of the joint is decreased. So it's a less stable joint. Now, if we have very little to no range of motion, then we have an extremely strong joint. So think of those synostotic joints where two separate bones have fused to become one. So those have no range of motion whatsoever. They're completely immobile. They are synarthrotic. Therefore, they are the strongest joints that we have. So the analogy I like to use when discussing this shoulder joint, glenohumeral joint, is the golf ball sitting on a tee analogy. So I made this illustration to the right. Here is my golf ball and here is my tee. So the golf ball is barely on this tee. So you wanna think of the golf ball as the head of the humerus. And the head of the humerus is barely on the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa of the scapula, kind of like, again, a golf ball on a tee. So therefore, it's going to rely on, on a number of supportive structures to stabilize this joint. Because the last thing we want is the head of the humerus to literally roll off the scapula, the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa of the scapula. If that happens, then we have a dislocated shoulder, either subluxation or if it's a full dislocation, luxation. So some of these supportive structures include skeletal muscle, tendons, and ligaments. Let's look at one of the supportive structures of the shoulder, and this is the glenoid labrum. And what the glenoid labrum is, it's a ring of fibrocartilage. So going back to my illustration to the right, I illustrate the glenoid labrum. So this basically helps deepen the pocket. It helps deepen the socket of the glenoid cavity. So looking at my illustration, I hope you see that the glenoid labrum extends beyond the bone. In other words, it extends beyond the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Now, if we refer to the image that we have on the top right-hand corner, I highlighted the glenoid labrum. So if you look, really look carefully, I'll highlight it in green, there's your glenoid labrum, right? That's your ring of fibrocartilage. What else do we have to help support this glenohumeral joint? Well, we have the acromion, which is part of the clavicle, and the coracoid process, which is part of the scapula. So going back to this image that we have over here, I want you to think of the coracoid process of the scapula sort of like a thumb, okay? And think of the acromion of the clavicle as your index finger. So imagine that you are gripping a ball, your, finger, your index finger and your thumb basically the coracoid process and the acromion. Now your fingers does not completely surround this ball that you're holding. So you're gripping a ball and that ball will represent the head of the humerus. So you're holding it, your thumb, coracoid process, and acromion, your finger, your index finger. So that helps hold on to the head of the humerus. What we also have in between the thumb, so-called coracoid process, and the index finger, the so-called acromion, is this coracrochromion ligament. So this band of ligament between these two bones will help again ensure that we have a more secure joint to keep the head from rolling off the glenoid cavity of the scapula. In addition, we also have various shoulder ligaments. In fact, we've already mentioned one, the coracoclavicular ligaments, but we also have additional ligaments associated with the shoulder. We have the glenohumeral, 
the coracohumeral, the coracochromio, the coracoclavicular, as we mentioned, and as well as the chromioclavicular. Now, as far as supportive structures are concerned regarding the shoulder joint, what offers the most support to the shoulder is the shoulder muscles referred to as the rotator cuff. So these rotator cuff muscles are skeletal muscles, and this offers the greatest stability, the greatest support to ensure that this joint does not disarticulate. We have the supraspinatus, we have the infraspinatus, we have the subscapularis, and we have the teres minor. I would like you to know these rotator cuff muscles, the so-called shoulder muscles. As far as the shoulder ligaments are concerned, I'm not expecting you to be able to identify it on an image. So in other words, I'm not going to have an image of your shoulder joint as what you see here and ask you to identify these ligaments since this is more of a lab activity versus a lecture activity. But please know these supportive structures as far as ensuring that the shoulder joint, the head of the humerus, as it articulates with the glenoid fossa of the scapula, remains aligned. The next synovial joint that we will discuss is the elbow joint, which is also known as the cubital joint. So the elbow joint is a stable hinge joint due to the presence of a thick joint capsule, as well as the bony surfaces of the humerus and ulna that interlock closely. Furthermore, the elbow joint contain multiple strong ligaments to reinforce this joint. It involves articulations between the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. Well, it turns out that we have three joints that's associated with this elbow. So we have the humeral ulnar joint, we have the humeral radial joint, and we have the proximal radial ulnar joint. So the humeral ulnar joint is your largest joint found in the elbow. This humeral ulnar joint is often the joint when the hinge joint of the elbow is discussed. So when they're talking about the bony surfaces of the humerus and the ulna that interlock closely, what they're actually referring to is this humeral ulnar joint between the humerus, once again, and the ulna. So let's look at the illustrations that we have or the images showing this joint of the elbow, one of the joints of the elbow. So here is an image of the humeral ulnar joint as well as down over here. So once again, this is the joint between the humerus and the ulna. And if we look at the image to the right, I'll highlight that in blue. So this is where the trochlear notch of the ulna will articulate with the trochlea of the humerus, forming one of the joints of the elbow. The second joint of the elbow is the humoradial joint. This time, it's a smaller joint, and it's the articulation between the humerus and the radius. So I'll highlight that in yellow. And once again, this is the joint between the humerus and the head of the radius. So the humeral ulnar and the humeral radial are both classified as being hinge joints, basically monaxial or uniaxial. So therefore, they can only do one angular or one rotation. And as we've already discussed, hinge joints can only do one angular, that being flexion, extension. They cannot hyperextend unless we break these joints. The third joint of the elbow is the proximal radial ulnar joint. So this is the articulation between the head of the radius as it articulates with the radial notch of the ulna. So I'll highlight that in green. And once again, this is the joint between the head of the radius as it articulates with the radial notch of the ulna. So this joint is a pivot joint. And just like the hinge joint, the pivot joint is also monaxial or uniaxial. It can only do one type of rotational movement, and that is supination and pronation. Supination being palms up, pronation being palms down. So when we flex at the elbow and extend at the elbow, the two joints of the elbow that allow us to do that is both the humeral ulnar and the humeral radial joint. Now when we supinate and pronate, then this involves the joint of the proximal radial ulnar joint. It does not involve the humeral ulnar or humeral radial joint. So as you can see with the elbow, it's a little more complicated than just simply saying that's a hinge joint. It just depends upon which of these three joints of the elbow that you're referring to.
So if you look closely at the images of the humeral ulna joints, I hope you see that it has all the characteristics or features of what makes this a synovial joint. We have the articular cartilage that we find both on the trochlear notch of the ulna as well as the trochlea of the humerus, as well as the joint capsule, which is also referred to as the articular capsule. And of course, we have the synovial cavity, also called the joint cavity, filled with synovial fluid. Furthermore, we have accessory structures, such as the bursa, and as well as fat pads. So before we move on to the next slide, I'd like to discuss the distal radial ulnar joint. So this distal radial ulnar joint is not part of the elbow joint. So please be careful in terms of proximal radial ulnar joint versus distal radial ulnar joint. The proximal radial ulnar joint is one of the joints of the elbow. It's a pivot joint. However, the distal radial ulnar joint is not. So this slide shows us the strong ligaments that help stabilize the elbow joint, the cubital joint. So we have the radial collateral ligament that stabilizes the lateral surface of the elbow joint, as you can see in this particular image. And it extends around the head of the radius. The second strong ligament is the ulnar collateral ligament, and this will stabilize the medial side of the joint and we can see it with this particular image. So this extends from the medial epicondyle of the humerus to the coronoid and the olecranon of the ulna. The last strong ligament is the radial ulnar ligament that surrounds the neck of the radius and binds the radius to the ulna. Now, I am not going to expect you to memorize the location of these ligaments. So in other words, you're not going to see a medial or lateral view of the elbow on the exam and ask you to identify these ligaments. Now, lastly, these ligaments are all considered extrinsic ligaments. They are not part of the joint capsule. Furthermore, they're extra capsular, meaning they're found outside of the joint capsule. The next synovial joint is the hip joint, which is also referred to as the coxal joint. Just like the shoulder joint, the hip joint is a ball and socket. Now, with one big difference, this ball and socket joint, the hip joint or the coxal joint, is significantly stronger than the shoulder joint. Now, it also has a wide range of motion. Now, the structures of the hip joint, what makes it such a strong ball and socket in comparison to the less stable shoulder joint is that the head of the femur fits nice and snug into the socket of the acetabulum. So it's a much deeper pocket or cavity, unlike the golf ball T analogy that I used for the shoulder joint. This is not what we have when it comes to the hip joint. So the acetabulum literally almost surrounds the head of the femur, which greatly increases the stability of this ball and socket joint. Furthermore, it too has a ring of fiber cartilage, and that's referred to as the acetabular labrum. So the acetabular labrum, just like the glenoid labrum of the shoulder joint, this too will extend that pocket or cavity even deeper. In addition, the hip joint will have these strong ligaments that further increases this ball and socket joint, the hip joint, also called the coxal joint. We have the iliofemoral, we have the puborofemoral, the ischiofemoral, the transverse acetabular, and the ligamentum teres. Now, once again, I'm not going to ask you to identify these ligaments on the exam. This is more lab-related material versus lecture-related material. The last synovial joint that we will discuss is the knee joint. The knee joint is a complicated hinge joint that transfers the weight from the femur to the tibia. So just like our hip joints, also called the coxal joints, our knee joints will bear the weight of our entire upper body. The articulations found in the knee joint are the two femur tibia articulations. At the medial, condyle of the femur as well as the medial condyle of the tibia, the lateral condyle of the femur with the lateral condyle of the tibia. We also have another articulation between the patella and the patellar surface of the femur. Now if we go into the joint cavity of this knee joint, we will have 
two menisci. We have the medial and lateral menisci, which are pads of fibrocartilage, cartilage. And this is located at the femur tibia articulation. So one of their functions is shock absorption, basically providing cushion, as well as improving the fit between the articulating surfaces of the femur and the tibia. Furthermore, they provide lateral and medial support to the knee. Lastly, they help distribute the upper body weight across their surfaces. In addition to the medial and lateral menisci found in the joint cavity, we also have seven major supporting ligaments. So we have the patellar ligament, which can be found anteriorly. We have two popliteal ligaments that we can find posteriorly, which we'll see with the next slide. We also have the anterior cruciate ligament, the ACL, the posterior cruciate ligament, or PCL, the tibial collateral ligament, which is also known as a medial collateral ligament, MCL, the fibular collateral ligament, also called the lateral collateral ligament, LCL. So one thing about our knee joint, what we have is a type of articulation where the femur is just literally sitting on top of the tibia. So unlike the hip joint, where the head of the femur fits nice and snug into a very deep pocket provided by the acetabulum, this is not the case with the knee joint. So I've made an illustration to the right to basically demonstrate or show you how we have the femur literally sitting on top of the tibia. Therefore, it relies on these seven major ligaments to stabilize this type of articulation. So one of the articulations that we mentioned is the lateral collateral ligament, also called the fibular collateral ligament. So what this provides is lateral support to this knee joint. It prevents the femur from basically moving laterally. Then we have the tibial collateral ligament, also called the medial collateral ligament. And this will prevent the femur from rolling to the side medially. In addition to these collateral ligaments, inside the joint cavity, we have the ACL. So the ACL, what that provides is it prevents the femur from rolling forward, from rolling anteriorly. While the PCL, the posterior cruciate ligament, also found inside the joint cavity, will prevent the femur from rolling backwards or rolling posteriorly. Now the two popliteal ligaments that we find in the posterior part of our knee also provides support to our knee, something that we'll look at when we look at the next slide. So before moving on to the next slide, please take the time to look at these images down below and identify these structures that we just went over. Now, if we look at the posterior of our knee joint, we find the two popliteal ligaments, and these run obliquely. So in addition to the posterior cruciate ligament, these popliteal ligaments will also help reinforce the knee joint by preventing the femur from rolling back, basically preventing the knee joint from hyperextension. Now, when we stand up and lock our knees, when we're fully extended at the knee joint, all these ligaments are very tight, are very taut. And this is to ensure that the articulation between the femur and the tibia are perfectly aligned. Now, when we begin to walk, where we, when we have to unlock our knees, the popliteus muscle, which can be seen down over here, will contract. And when they contract, they help unlock our knees. That way we can flex at the knee and begin to walk. Now, when our knees are fully locked, when these ligaments are very tight and there is no slack, the last thing we want to have happen is some type of lateral force hitting our knee joint. Because what can happen is those structures that we just went over that's associated with the knee joint can potentially tear. And so we have these three C's of knee injuries that I'd like to quickly go over. So we have the cruciates that involve damage to the ACL or PCL, the collaterals, the second C, damage to the MCL, LCL, and the last C are the cartilages, the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus. So if we quickly look at this image over here, this hockey puck is traveling with a great amount of force, so much so that when it hits the lateral aspect or the lateral side of our knee joint, the tibial collateral ligament is torn, 
the medial meniscus is torn as well as the anterior cruciate ligament is torn. So here are your three C's. The tibial collateral ligament, the medial collateral ligament, and the anterior cruciate ligament. The three C's of knee injury. Now, what if we are hit medially? So instead of the hockey puck hitting our knee joint laterally, what happens if it hits medially? Then what will happen is we have damage to the opposite side. So in other words, we would have damage to our lateral collateral ligament, which will give us our first C, and damage to the lateral meniscus, our second C, and chances are we damage as well as the posterior cruciate ligament, this third C. And here's another image showing us once again the three C's of knee injury.